So good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. My, and welcome to this uh, WHO HIV drug resistance webinar. My name is Silvia Bertagnolio. I'm the technical lead on HIV drug resistance at the World Health Organization in Geneva. Um, so I want to welcome you all, and, and I want to welcome all the speakers uh, to this webinar that has been organized to celebrate the World Antimicrobial Awareness Week. We know that antimicrobial resistance is a global priority that needs coordinated action across all uh, governmental health sectors, as well as the uh, all level of society. We also know that HIV drug resistance uh, needs to be monitored, needs to be prevented, and needs to be addressed. And this strategy is part of a more comprehensive response to address H uh, antimicrobial drug resistance. So over the past uh, decade, we have witnessed an incredible expansion of antiretroviral therapy. And we know that the therapy has saved the lives of millions of people. Now, uh, we can't compromise the effectiveness of uh, new regimens that have become available uh, in low middle income setting as well as high income setting. So it's our collective responsibility to protect, protect the long-term effectiveness of new HIV in medicine. Uh, during the course of this webinar, um, you will hear um, great talks about uh, new HIV drug resistance epidemiological information. You will hear about uh, new innovative uh, methods to assess HIV drug resistance at population level. And you will hear about what we know about HIV drug resistance um, uh, and new antiretroviral drugs, um, such as dolutegravir, or resistance uh, 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 to drugs used for uh, HIV prevention. Um, so please stay with us and, um, and uh, enjoy this webinar together. Um, I have the pleasure to co-chair this meeting with uh, Carol Wallis. Carol is from the Bio, um, Bioanalytical Research Corporation and Lancet Laboratories in South Africa. So welcome, Carol. And uh, without further ado, I hand over to Meg Dorothy for a few remarks. Uh, Meg is the director of the Department of uh, Global HIV, STI, and Hepatitis programs at WHO in Geneva. OK, thank you, uh, Sylvia. And it's really my great pleasure to be able to open up this uh, important webinar. And when you have a moment to put up the first slides, we'll, we'll start to see some of the great work that this group has been doing and uh, how important it is that we prioritize this work towards achieving the global targets and epidemic control by 2030. Global stakeholders should act to prevent, monitor, and respond to HIV drug resistance. WHO in 2017 developed a global action plan for HIV drug resistance. WHO encourages and supports well the implementation of high impact interventions to prevent and respond to HIV drug resistance, including the rapid transition to dolutegravir based antiretroviral regimens and monitoring the HIV care service delivery and strategies to ensure uninterrupted drug supplies. And some of you may know that uh, we have multiple uh, policies and procedures and guidelines regarding ensuring that we maintain uh, optimal ARV treatment. And as countries use optimized regimens with new and effective drugs for HIV, we need to protect our investments, the long-term efficacies of the drug, and we need to have systematic monitoring of HIV drug resistance at population level as well as surveillance of emerging resistance to dolutegravir. So WHO is committed to support these activities, support the prevention and monitoring and control of drug resistance in countries, and looking forward to where there may be new regimens coming in, whether long acting, new molecules that we keep an eye so that we can protect all the investments we're making in the current regimen. On this slide, you'll see today that we're we have the great pleasure of being able to launch three new technical documents on HIV drug resistance surveillance for countries scaling up pre-exposure prophylaxis or PrEP, WHO uh, guidance and a drug resistance laboratory operational framework, which is the second edition, so an update 
that includes some really important strategic developments, including next generation sequencing methods and updates of the SOPs and quality assurance procedures for HIV sequencing around integrase genes and assays for validation of the recommendations. And this moves us into a new era of being able to monitor for dolutegravir based resistance. And lastly, we have a manual for HIV drug resistance testing using dry blood spots uh, specimens. And this is a third updated edition and emphasizes the best practices on dry blood spot preparation, storage, and shipping, as well as selection of appropriate and positive controls. And this sets us up to be able to use some of the new methodologies of, of using whether they're dry blood spots or others for some of our surveillance as we move forward. So next slide, please. I recommend that you come to our new updated website page. WHO has gone through a transition in, in all of its websites. And I think what you'll find on this new website is that you'll be able to find maps, you'll find new infographics, and the global action plan and approaches for prevention, surveillance, and joining in on the activities of the laboratory network. So with this, it's really my great pleasure to be able to open up this session, pass back to Sylvia, and uh, I'm sure we're going to have an exciting session to be able to understand the impact of drug resistance and how to avoid it in this World Antimicrobial Awareness Week. Back to you, Sylvia. Thank you. So thanks very much, Meg. Um, it's Carol Wallace here, the other co-chair. Um, just before I introduce Sylvia, I would just like to, um, to all the people who are joining us this afternoon, to please, if you have questions during the session, to put it in the chat box, and I'll coordinate for um, all of them for the Q&A session that will come at the end of all of the talks. So um, I'd just like to now take the opportunity to introduce Sylvia. She's not a stranger to anyone on the call. Um, and to go through some of the WHO framework for addressing HIV drug resistance in global epidemiology. Um, Sylvia? So WHO has developed a WHO framework to address HIV drug resistance. WHO framework really um, started from the political declaration on ending AIDS epidemic by 2030. So what happened in 2016 is that governments met in New York at the General Assembly, the UN General Assembly, and committed to end AIDS. As part of that commitment, government also uh, committed to establish effective system to monitor for, to prevent and respond to drug resistance emergence. So at that time, government committed not only to end AIDS, but also to end HIV drug resistance as part of a, a more comprehensive response to tackle the epidemic of HIV. Um, so as, uh, as a consequence, WHO developed a global action plan on HIV drug resistance to really support countries in the uh, implementation of key effective measures to tackle HIV drug resistance. The global action plan includes five strategic objectives and aims to um, create awareness and advocacy on HIV drug resistance among stakeholders. Number two, to uh, support countries in the prevention and monitoring and uh, response to HIV drug resistance. And number three, really to provide the framework for all stakeholders. Uh, so each stakeholder has its own part to play from the academia, civil society, government, and um, international organization, uh, as well as people living with HIV and other stakeholders. The Global Action Plan on Resistance mirrors the Global Action Plan on Antimicrobial Resistance because HIV drug resistance is clearly intimately linked with the broader antimicrobial resistance um, uh, co concern and, and, and response. Um, in response or to support the Global Action Plan, WHO has also developed a number of uh, documents, normative guidance and reports uh, throughout, the, throughout the years. And you can see that in the latest years, we have uh, updated and developed new documents. Um, the Global Action Plan um, really uh, uh, is based on a strong case. Mathematical modeling um, has helped us to understand that if we are not active in preventing HIV drug resistance, or not only preventing, but also responding to drug resistance when a resistance emerges, 
we are going to have important human and, uh, and programmatic uh, consequences, particularly related to cost. Um, if drug resistance to NNRTIs among people initiating antiretroviral therapy, what we call pretreatment drug resistance, increases to level above 10% in Sub-Saharan Af Africa, uh, modeling suggests that or indicates that um, there will be uh, a very important and significant uh, cost in terms of new HIV infection that are uh, related to HIV drug resistance and caused by HIV drug resistance. An increased number of uh, HIV drug resistance uh, induced uh, AIDS death uh, and increased uh, cost for the treatment programs. So clearly indicates that uh, resistance needs to be tackled and needs to be addressed. The Global Action Plan uh, uh, includes five strategic objectives, um, prevention and response, surveillance, research and innovation, laboratory strengthening and governance and enabling mechanism. The first one, prevention and response, is clearly uh, critical. Prevention of drug resistance um, is, a first, uh, is a first arm that we have to uh, tackle uh, HIV drug resistance. And preventing drug resistance can be done uh, through an improving the quality of uh, HIV service delivery. Uh, particularly now that we are moving towards the use of new antiretroviral therapy, including dolutegravir, we need really to be uh, really active and engaged to uh, increase the quality of care in order to minimize and prevent resistance emerging to these new precious drugs. So while we cannot do much to prevent resistance um, through uh, acting through the virus or uh, the drugs, uh, we can really do uh, a lot by uh, improving uh, adherence intervention and, and adherence in patients through improving uh, the performance uh, both at, cl at clinic level or at HIV program level to uh, optimize care and minimize the emergence of resistance. The second strategic objective of the Global Action Plan is monitoring and surveillance. WHO has um, uh, developed guidance uh, of uh, drug resistance surveillance uh, uh, leading to nationally representative results. And this slide show the many countries that have been implementing drug resistance service throughout the many years since 2004. Um, and so this number is increasing and countries are really starting now to implement surveillance as part of their national treatment program. Um, the surveillance data that are generated through national representative service are then included in the and uploaded on the WHO HIV drug resistance surveillance database. And this database is helpful because these countries in quality assuring their results uh, and generating um, you know, strong um, reports that uh, have uh, a clean, a clean EPI and, and sequence data set. WHO uh, has uh, collated uh, HIV drug resistance data and produced global reports that have been then uh, assisting and informing the development of uh, clinical guidance on HIV treatment over the years. HIV drug resistance surveillance could not be possible without the support of a strong network of laboratories accredited by WHO to um, do drug resistance testing using both plasma or dry blood spot. And you can see in this slide the uh, 33 plus laboratories that have received designation by WHO to do resistance testing and to assist countries in implementation of drug resistance surveillance. Um, they are at national level, regional level, or specialized level with different functions and different tasks and responsibilities. Some are designated to perform drug resistance testing using plasma, other to perform drug resistance testing using dry blood spot. Uh, and, um, and many are now designated to do drug resistance testing for integrase. On the left hand side, you can see the normative guidance and technical guidance that WHO has developed to support uh, strengthening and the expansion of the drug resistance uh, laboratory network. The third strategic objective is research and innovation. In this slide, you see a list of uh, research questions that have been identified by uh, HIV ResNet and other experts and um, summarize really what are the uh, key questions that uh, as of today we need to address uh, on HIV drug resistance and clearly impact uh, uh, our treatment and the efficacy of, of, of the drugs that we are using both for treatment and for prevention. Um, and I would like to highlight the uh, 
a, 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 new, a new document, a new papers that has been released recently, a couple of days ago, that uh, um, uh, systematic review and meta-analysis on the impact of pretreatment drug resistance uh, on NNRTI um, uh, regimen and shows that uh, a people initiating NNRTI-based regimen with pretreatment resistance um, had uh, increased risk of virological failure, acquisition of new resistance mutation, uh, increased risk of ART switch compared to those that start NNRTI without NNRTI resistance. Um, so this systematic review uh, shed a light on the negative impact of uh, pretreatment resistance uh, as there were uh, at times conflicting results from studying addressing um, this, this, quest this research question. So these data have been uh, informed uh, the public health response to pretreatment drug resistance guidelines that WHO has released in 2017. These guidelines indicate the, the, the needs to move away from NNRTI-based therapy in population where prevalence of pretreatment drug resistance was at or above the 10% and indicate the clear need to use uh, non-NRTI-based regimen where, where level of resistance were, were high. WHO has developed guidance on, on, on uh, a, a optimal first line, second line, and third line regimen selection. And, uh, and so we made great progress uh, over the years to improve the effectiveness and the robustness of the regimens provided to people living with HIV. Still though, there remain some important uh, and critical question that needs to be addressed um, in the era of, of, of integrase inhibitors. Um, one question is about the best third line regimen that can be provided to patient failing to lutegravir based regimen. And, um, and also what is the optimal ARV sequencing strategy in the era of first and second line um, uh, integrase, uh, integrase use. Um, another question is whether uh, it is safe to recycle tenofovir among people that are uh, failing uh, a favirance-based regimen with tenofovir uh, as a, included as a backbone and switch to TLD, which uh, include dolutegravir and tenofovir. So is it safe to move from TLE to TLD and keep the same NRTI backbone? The third question is about uh, uh, integrase inhibitors such as cabotegravir long-acting that is now used for pre prevention of HIV infection. And the question is whether uh, if resistance emerged to cabotegravir, um, whether this has uh, impact, a major impact on dolutegravir-based ART. Um, so these are really critical questions that uh, requires research, more research uh, and implementation data. And then I move to the last strategic objective, which is the number five, governance and enabling mechanism. And this strategic objective highlights the importance of making drug resistance um, data simple to understand by all policymakers, by all stakeholders, at can, particularly at country level, um, that need to act upon the data, use the data to improve the performance of the treatment program. Um, and also highlight the importance of uh, strengthened literacy among people living with HIV uh, and as well as a provider of care uh, and to create awareness of what each partner, what each stakeholder can do to prevent HIV drug resistance and to address drug resistance when resistance arises. So in conclusion, resistance, um, we all agree that is an integral component of HIV treatment program. And as we know, the effectiveness of NNRTIs uh, has been uh, partially uh, compromised by the emergence of resistance over the years, but we need really then uh, to we need really need to protect then the, our investment and uh, protect the preserve the effectiveness of new antiretrovirals that are now uh, available uh, and used uh, in low and middle income settings such as integrase inhibitors, uh, both for treatment and for prevention. So WHO is really committed working with ResNet and partners. Um, to uh, implement the framework that has been developed to tackle HIV drug resistance at country level, is committed to support countries in its implementation and to monitor the evolution of drug resistance both at national level and at the global level. 
and is really uh, committed to support countries in the implementation of the National Action Plan on resistance in strong collaboration uh, with AMR. And lastly, to really support the, uh, the use of, of drug resistance data to uh, inform treatment policy and improve HIV uh, treatment uh, at country level and globally. Thank you very much. And I would like now to hand over to Seth Inzaule. Seth um, is uh, working at African CDC uh, on pathogen genomics for public health surveillance in Africa, including for antimicrobial resistance and emerging and re-emerging infection. Seth, over to you. Thank you, Sylvia. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. As Sylvia has mentioned, I'll be giving a presentation on the global status of HIV drug resistance, and these findings are based on the 2019 WHO HIV drug resistance report. As we have heard from Sylvia, one of the components in the HIV drug resistance strategy is prevention, and one of the components under prevention is the monitoring of programmatic quality indicators that are associated with the emergence of HIV drug resistance, for which we call the early warning indicators. The second component that we have had is surveillance, which involves conducting surveys in patients who are initiating treatment, which we call the pretreatment drug resistance, as well as conducting surveys in infants newly diagnosed with HIV, as well as conducting surveys of HIV drug resistance in patients who are in treatment, which we call the acquired drug resistance. The, uh, this presentation will focus on these four components. First, we look at the pretreatment drug resistance in adolescents and adults. Between 2014 and 2019, we had 18 countries that reported this data to WHO, and the prevalence of NNRTI-PDR had exceeded 10% in 12 of the 18 countries, and was even higher in some countries, exceeding 20% in countries like South Africa, Cuba, and Honduras. The prevalence of pretreatment drug resistance was also higher in patients who initiated treatment while reporting prior exposure to antiretroviral drugs. And this group include patients who had defaulted from care and were in reinitiating treatment, as well as patients who had been exposed to pre-exposure prophylaxis, as well as post-exposure prophylaxis. The prevalence of PDR in this group was three times higher than those who initiated treatment while they were ARV naive. And in particular, the PDR prevalence in this group was 21.1% compared to 7.8% in the ARV naive group. As we have heard from Sylvia, most of the countries are already uh, have already transitioned or are in the process of transitioning to dolutegravir-based regimen, as indicated in this map by the different shades of green. However, 15% of the countries are still using a favorance based regimen and in 2019 we had about 210,000 patients who were initiated on a favorance based regimen in these countries. And this suggests that these patients could be still at risk of poor treatment outcomes due to the increasing levels of NNRTI drug resistance. Next we look at drug resistance in infants newly diagnosed with HIV. Between 2012 and 2018, we had nine countries reporting this data to WHO, and all of these countries are in Africa. The levels of NNRTI drug resistance in this group was quite high, ranging from 34% in Eswatini to 69% in Malawi. And uh, these findings indicate that nearly 50% of newly diagnosed infants with HIV carried drug resistance HIV before initiating treatment. The levels of NRTI drug resistance were also high in this group and uh, it had exceeded 10% in 5 out of 9 of the countries reporting data. And uh, the prevalence of NRTI drug resistance was majorly driven by resistance to abacavir and the cytosine analogues lamivudine or remtricitabine. And these are also the drugs that are commonly used in infants. As Sylvia had already mentioned, that most of the countries are moving to the WHO recommended regimen, that is lopinavir for children who are less than three years or dolutegravir for children uh, uh, who are at least 20 kilos. However, just to mention that a recent report by Chai indicated that in 2019, 61% of the children were still on NNRTI-based regimen. 
However, there is good news as uh, dolutegravir that could be used for children who are at least 3 kilos have just been recently approved, suggesting that countries can quickly move to adapt this regimen for children, uh, for these particular children. Next, we look at HIV drug resistance in patients who are failing treatment or what we consider as acquired drug resistance. Conventionally, these surveys are conducted uh, in, in patients who have been on treatment for at least 12 months, as well as in long-term treated patients who have been on treatment for at least uh, 48 months. And between 2015 and 2018, we had 17 surveys that were conducted in eight countries, four of them in sub-Saharan Africa, three in the Americas, and one in Southeast Asia. This slide shows uh, the viral load suppression rate with the blue bars showing uh, the suppression rate in the early time point survey, that is patients who have been on treatment for 12 months, and the green bars showing uh, the viral load suppression in patients who have been on long-term treatment. Only three of nine countries achieved the third 90 target for viral load suppression, that is Eswatini, Uganda for the early time point, and Vietnam. And just to indicate that viral load suppression was lower in the late time point compared to the early time point. This slide shows the prevalence of acquired drug resistance by drug class and country. Overall, what we observed was that the levels of drug resistance was quite high in patients who are failing treatment, uh, with the prevalence of NNRTI resistance ranging from 67% in Eswatini to 90% in Uganda, while the prevalence of NRTI resistance ranging from 39% in Senegal to 84% in Uganda. We also observed a high prevalence of resistance to both tenofovir and the cytosine analogs with a pooled prevalence showing uh, a prevalence of 38.5% in patients who have been on treatment for at least 12 months and um, a pooled prevalence of 42.9% for patients who have been on long-term treatment. There is limited data on viral load suppression and HIV drug resistance from programs among adults on dolutegravir and children on lopinavir-based regimen. And the surveys uh, to assess these are either planned or ongoing. However, uh, preliminary data suggest improved viral response with programmatic data in Kenya showing that patients on dolutegravir-based ART had a viral suppression prevalence of 96.4% compared to 92.4% for patients who are still on efavirenz-based regimen. And this reflects a 4 percentage point difference. And this was also observed in Malawi where prior transitioning to dolutegravir, the uh, prevalence of viral suppression was 89%, but this, tro this rose to uh, 93% uh, after transitioning to dolutegravir. However, just to note that the viral uh, suppression outcomes may differ by population, with a large data set in Uganda showing that patients who who, who had started, who was started on dolutegravir had a 91% viral suppression compared to 96% for patients who had been transitioned from other regimens. Equally, a study in Zambia showed that patients who were switched to dolutegravir with um, viral loads of less than 1,000 copies per ml seems to perform better compared to patients who were switched uh, to dolutegravir with higher viral loads of above 1,000. Data on resistance emerging from patients on dolutegravir in programmatic settings is also limited, although data from clinical studies su suggest that dolutegravir resistance is rare. But a recent study from Malawi showed that two of six patients with confirmed virological failure had resistance to dolutegravir. Uh, however, just to note that these patients also had NRTI resistance at baseline. Viral response in children on lopinavir is however suboptimal, with data from Kenya showing only 82% viral suppression and that in Uganda showing about 85%. Next we look at the EWIs. Here we look at a subset of the EWIs, that is retention, stockouts, viral load coverage and viral load suppression. And this data uh, came from 50, the 50 WHO uh, high burden focus countries. As for retention, in 2016, um, 40% of the countries achieved the retention target of having at least 
of the patients retained in care 12 months after starting treatment, but this had dropped to 19% by 2018. Uh, for stockouts, we had 50% reporting zero stockouts in 2016, and this had slightly increased to 54% in 2019. For viral load coverage, we had 17% of countries in 2016 reporting having at least 70% coverage, but this increased to 40% in 2018. A similar trend was observed for viral load suppression, where we had 38% of the countries achieving the third 90 target, uh, uh, but this, and this improved uh, significantly to 60% in 2019. Lastly, we look at the potential impact of COVID-19 on programmatic quality indicators associated with the emergence of HIVDR. And between April and June of this year, WHO conducted a survey in 127 countries. 36 of the countries reported disruptions in the provision of ARV services, and this reflects 45% uh, of the total population living with HIV on treatment. In 24 countries, there was critical low stock, stocks of antiretrovirals that of actually less than three months, and this reflects 33% of the total population living with HIV on treatment. Equally, uh, there have been reports on missed on time drug pill pickups of between 14 to 19%, but just to note that most countries are reporting the mitigation strategies uh, recommended by WHO, including the multi-month dispensing. There have been also disruptions in adherent support systems as well as reduction in viral load testing. In conclusion, we observed high levels of pretreatment drug resistance to NNRTI-based regimens, but countries are already switching to dolutegravir-based treatment as per WHO recommendations. However, 15% of countries are still using efavirenz-based regimens, suggesting the need to transition to dolutegravir. Alternatively, these countries can conduct PDR surveys so as to inform optimization of treatment as well as promoting rapid transition to dolutegravir. We also observe very high levels of pretreatment drug resistance to NNRTI-based regimens in children, and this suggests the need to switch to the recommended non-NNRTI-based regimens, including the newly approved dolutegravir. Early findings on viral response for dolutegravir suggest good efficacy, but up to 7% virological failure has been observed, suggesting the need for close monitoring. The treatment response in children who have been switched to lopinavir-based regimen is also suboptimal, suggesting the need for close monitoring. And lastly, the COVID-19 disruptions that are being observed are likely to lead to an increased risk of HIV drug resistance, and this necessitates the swift implementation of the proposed mitigation strategies and the need to review early warning indicators as well as conducting surveys of HIV drug resistance so as to assess the potential impact. I'd like to acknowledge the following. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Seth. Um, and would with that, I would like to um, introduce um, Michael Jordan. Michael is working at Stuart Levy Center for Integrate Management of AMR, Tax University uh, in the US. So Michael, over to you to speak about uh, innovative HIV drug resistance surveillance, new methods on the horizon. Good afternoon and good morning to all of you. It's my pleasure to present today WHO's HIV drug resistance survey methods. In particular, I'll be focusing on new methods related to acquired drug resistance in populations taking antiretroviral therapy, and also focus on methods for individuals accessing pre-exposure prophylaxis. Next slide, please. Fundamental to optimal antiviral drug stewardship is obtaining high quality data from periodic surveys while expanding the coverage of routine viral load testing and drug resistance testing. As we've heard, there are five main elements of WHO's resistance and monitoring strategy that include surveillance of acquired resistance, surveillance of resistance in populations initiating or reinitiating antiretroviral therapy, called pretreatment drug resistance, drug resistance in infants less than 18 months of age, and finally, drug resistance in individuals who are taking PrEP and who uh, become infected with HIV. 
We also heard about early warning indicators, which really are the heart of the drug resistance prevention and monitoring strategy. As we all know, WHO has elaborated numerous guidelines and tools which are available for countries to use, supported by the Global HIV Drug Resistance Database. Next slide, please. Focusing now on nationally representative surveys of acquired drug resistance and WHO's new acquired drug resistance method. Let us first acknowledge that antiretroviral therapy and viral load coverage has significantly increased in many countries. This allows us to potentially leverage remnant viral load specimens for the purpose of drug resistance testing. Countries can perform a readiness assessment, specifically if viral load coverage is equal to or exceeds 60%, if minimum variable availability is greater than 80%, if remnant viral load specimens have been stored in an optimal way to allow drug resistance testing, and if policies and procedures are in place to test remnant specimens, countries may consider further uh, implementation of this new nationally representative survey method. Please advance. However, if countries find that they don't meet criteria to implement this uh, new uh, laboratory-based ADR survey, please keep in mind that very importantly, clinic-based ADR surveys can be implemented following WHO's 2014 guidelines. If, however, these minimum criteria on the left are met, please advance, countries are able to implement the new laboratory-based ADR method, which I will describe in the next few slides. Please advance. The new method accommodates countries' transition to dolutegravir-based ART, which is underway, as we heard, in most high-burden countries. Importantly, it recognizes that the pace of transition may vary from country to country, and it also respects that in some countries, the transition to dolutegravir-based therapies may not occur in the near future. In other words, there may be populations of people who are on very different regimens all at the same time, all of which we need to understand in order to make informative national decisions. The survey further acknowledges the desire and indeed need for robust estimates of dolutegravir resistance in order to facilitate the monitoring of trends over time and to well characterize dolutegravir resistance in populations exposed to this drug. Finally, um, the survey will not only yield overall estimates, but also precise estimates of people of, of acquired resistance in people taking non dolutegravir based regimens. Let's explore a little bit further. The survey population are individuals on ART for at least six months with viral non-suppression, all of whom who have had a routine programmatic viral load. Please advance. The survey sites include all viral load testing laboratories in a country in order to obtain representativeness. Sites or viral load labs must have stored viral load specimens with copies greater than 1,000 collected as part of routine care. And we recommend that the uh, collection period be three months. From each viral load laboratory, a sample of remnant viral load specimens is taken, and that sample is proportional to the size of the laboratory, and we use systematic sampling to guarantee representativeness. As we heard earlier, the WHO has a very robust designated viral uh, drug resistance testing laboratory, and in this case, um, we recommend that the uh, reverse transcriptase, protease, and integrase regions of HIV all be sequenced in order to uh, obtain comprehensive information. Please advance. Finally, minimum variables, which include the regimen, the age of the patient, and the gender are abstracted uh, from the viral load lab requisition form. The identified data may be uploaded, provided using tools provided by WHO into the database for quality assurance of both epidemiological and sequence information. Countries can, of course, therefore generate reports for the purpose of informing their own national regimens. Please advance. It's very important to keep in mind that we must not only look at adults taking antiretroviral therapy, but also children. And therefore, this new method emphasizes that we do 
uh, surveys in adults and in pediatric and adolescent populations simultaneously. Next slide, please. The primary outcome includes prevalence of acquired resistance amongst individuals with viral non-suppression who are on ART for at least six months, irrespective of their ART regimen. So we have an overall understanding of the prevalence of ADR. Please advance. Importantly, we also estimate the prevalence of dolutegravir resistance amongst individuals with viral non-suppression who are on ART. So in this survey, we actually have two outcomes, prevalence of overall HIV drug resistance, which of course can be stratified by drug and drug class, age, gender, but more importantly, or equally importantly, we have uh, a clear prevalence estimate of dolutegravir resistance amongst those with viral non-suppression on dolutegravir-containing regimens. In this slide, I summarize the sample size assumptions that we have used in developing this protocol. You'll see that the expected prevalence of dolutegravir resistance is a modest 3.5%. We aim for overall uh, precision of uh, plus or minus 6% for the overall uh, estimate of overall acquired drug resistance. However, for patients on dolutegravir, uh, we aim for a more precise estimate with a 95% uh, confidence interval of plus or minus 2%. The sample sizes of 267 and 325 are shown below, and of course they are inflated for expected genotyping amplification uh, success or failure rate. Of note, sample sizes will vary from country to country depending on the numbers of people on ART, the numbers of people with viral non-suppression. Indeed, as part of this method, we will have available online a calculator which will allow you to input uh, certain country level metadata to arrive at a very precise uh, uh, estimate of sample size for your particular country for this survey type. Next slide, please. Focusing now on surveys of pretreatment drug resistance, we remind ourselves that this survey type gives us an estimate of the prevalence of drug resistance in individuals initiating or reinitiating antiretroviral therapy. Like all surveys, it's a point prevalence and confidence interval where we can disaggregate by any drug resistance and by drug and drug class. Surveys of pretreatment drug resistance, I will add, are very important no matter the regimen that is being used in country. Of course, that applies as well if we're using dolutegravir. Uh, we need to understand and characterize the prevalence of NRTI resistance in individual populations who are beginning DTG-containing regimens. We use this information to support national and global decision-making regarding the choice of first-line ART, and this survey method allows us to analyze trends and drug resistance over time. Next slide, please. Just to remind ourselves that this survey uses probability proportional to size sampling methods where clinics are sampled. Uh, we have information in individuals who are starting first line ART, all individuals, but recognizing that that all individual uh, population actually contains individuals who are ARV drug naive and those with prior ARV drug exposure. And so this survey method will allow us to estimate the prevalence of resistance in all of these populations. Please advance. Remembering the sample size is approximately 400 um, with 15 uh, to 30 clinics. This information, of course, is used uh, to inform first-line regimen selection. And Sylvia and in her initial presentation and Seth made reference uh, to these data. Next slide. Focusing now on surveys of drug resistance in infants less than 18 months of age, we can use this to estimate the prevalence of resistance overall amongst those infants with a history of exposure to PMTCT with no or unknown exposure as well to PMTCT. We can also estimate the proportion of infants who are with or without any known history of exposure to uh, PMTCT. Next slide. In this slide, HIV, um, the survey population, of course, is infants who are diagnosed with HIV through early infant diagnosis. The survey sites are all EID testing labs within the country with a sampling period of generally three months. From each of the EID labs in a country, a sample of remnant specimens is selected using systematic sampling in order to have a, a representative random sample. And sampling is proportional to the size of the lab. Next slide, please. 
WHO designated laboratories are used uh, next. Uh, and data uh, minimal variables are of course abstracted from EID requisition forms and linked to uh, genotypes in the WHO database. Next slide. Focusing now on surveillance of drug resistance in populations accessing PrEP, we need to acknowledge that the prevalence of drug resistance in real world settings may actually be different than that which was observed in controlled settings and clinical trials. HIV drug resistance selected by pre-exposure prophylaxis may potentially impact treatment outcomes amongst those PrEP users who acquire drug resistance. Please advance. The purpose of this survey published in October of 2020 uh, is to assess the prevalence of drug resistance in PrEP users diagnosed with HIV in order to inform optimal selection of the most maximally effective first line ART for individuals who become infected with HIV despite the use of PrEP. Please advance. The primary outcome is the prevalence of predicted tenofovir and or XTC resistance amongst those who are diagnosed with HIV who've taken PrEP at any time during the previous three months and who have a drug resistance genotype available. Information, of course, can be disaggregated by gender, age band, PrEP regimen, and dosing strategy. Please advance. As new PrEP regimens become available, and we of course recognize this is very dynamic, the outcome will be expanded to assess the prevalence of resistance in newer PrEP drugs and drug classes. This slide summarizes an overview of the method. So if according to national policy, drug resistance testing is routinely performed amongst all PrEP users who test positive for HIV, then one can simply aggregate at an annual basis the uh, prevalence data of drug resistance and produce a report with this information. If, however, um, drug resistance testing is not performed on individuals who are infected with HIV despite the use of PrEP, one can implement the cross-sectional survey to assess the prevalence of resistance um, in, with using a periodicity of every three to five years. Next slide. Simply summarizing the methods, it's a census of all eligible information, uh, all eligible individuals who will contribute information. This, of course, acknowledges that the HIV infection is expected to be very infrequent amongst those who use PrEP. All PrEP sites in a country ideally participate to the survey in order to achieve a truly representative sample. This will often require uh, advanced training and resources. Anyone who is eligible uh, must have provided informed consent, have taken PrEP within the preceding three months. They can be uh, included regardless of the PrEP regimen and dosing strategy, and of course must be uh, diagnosed with HIV. Drug resistance testing performed at WHO designated laboratories. And with the support of the WHO database uh, for data uh, cleaning, simple proportions and confidence intervals adjusted for clustering can be calculated with results, as I mentioned, disaggregated by age band, PrEP regimen and dosing strategy. Next slide. We've made mention on several occurrences of WHO's HIV drug resistance database. It is designed to capture individual site level and survey level information and to support the quality assurance of sequence and epidemiological data. Importantly, it provides a, a safe repository for countries uh, for the storage of their data. Next slide. Fundamental again to antiretroviral drug stewardship is the prevention of HIV drug resistance and the delivery of high quality care. These indicators published in WHO's Consolidated HIV Strategic Information Guidelines in mid-2020 are all associated with HIV drug resistance prevention. They include attrition, proportion of people with viral load suppression, viral load testing coverage, appropriate use of viral load testing, ARV drug stockout, adherence uh, as measured by on-time ARV drug pickup, and importantly, appropriate switch to second-line ART. You're all, you, as you can all see, there are performance strata, <clears throat> green, yellow, or red, each of which um, is grounded in the scientific and medical literature. And some of these targets have been recently updated uh, for those of you that are familiar with our EWIs. Um, next slide. <clears throat> 
Um, of course, EWI monitoring is done to inform site and program level actions. Um, and this model of plan, do, study, act cycle simply is meant to illustrate that we don't monitor early warning indicators of drug resistance simply for monitoring them, but rather to investigate programmatic and clinic level factors, which can be corrected uh, often using uh, local innovative solutions. Next slide. To conclude, routine surveillance of drug resistance following a global standard, representative methods provides countries with evidence to optimize patient and population level treatment outcomes and does support optimal stewardship of antiretroviral drugs, both at the local, national, and global levels. I've summarized today HIV drug resistance surveillance amongst people with acquired drug resistance, which provides information both on drug resistance as well as viral load outcomes with a focus on dolutegravir. Pretreatment drug resistance important regardless of whether or not dolutegravir or non-dolutegravir based regimens are used in populations. And I presented to you drug resistance in populations uh, of PrEP. Um, and finally, monitoring and closing gaps and quality of care leading to drug resistance is really the foundation of the HIV drug resistance strategy and is truly fundamental to the prevention of emergence and transmission of drug resistant virus. Next slide. I would like to conclude by, by thanking Sylvia and the rest of the HIV drug resistance team um, and also working group two of the GAP of which I'm co-chair with Andrew Phillips. Thank you. Thanks very much, Michael. So we move um, to the next talk, um, which is Daniel Koritskis, who is Head of Infectious Disease um, at Brigham and Women's Health Hospital, um, who's going to talk to us about dolutegravir resistance. Dan? Uh, thanks very much, Carol. It's a pleasure to be speaking to you all today. I'm going to be uh, speaking about dolutegravir resistance, uh, as Carol mentioned. Uh, if I can have the next slide, please. These are my disclosures. Next slide. Uh, there's a, a, quite a lot to cover in very little time, so I'm going to go very rapidly and hopefully can return uh, in the question and answer period to any things I've left uncovered. We know that for the uh, currently approved uh, integrase strand transfer inhibitors that there are a set of uh, common mutations that confer resistance. The relative impact of these mutations on the level of susceptibility varies from drug to drug, uh, but if enough of these mutations accumulate, particularly through the use of uh, some of the first generation integrase strand transfer inhibitors, such as raltegravir and elvitegravir, there may be cross resistance to dolutegravir and bictegravir. Uh, likewise, we know that uh, cross resistance between dolutegravir and bictegravir uh, is uh, relatively uh, uniform. Uh, and there is very little, if any, experience with bictegravir uh, in uh, uh, integrase inhibitor experienced patients. Next slide, please. Uh, this slide shows the phenotypic consequences of uh, uh, these uh, various integrase uh, mutations. You can see the very high levels of uh, uh, resistance uh, conferred by um, uh, individual mutations at, at particular codons for raltegravir and elvitegravir, and the relatively uh, smaller effect they have on susceptibility to dolutegravir. Um, it requires multiple uh, combinations of these mutations to uh, see significant shifts in the EC50 uh, or inhibitory concentrations required uh, for uh, dolutegravir um, and, and perhaps uh, a greater effect on cabotegravir, uh, which uh, John, may, uh, John Mellors may touch on in his talk on PrEP. Uh, you also see that for dolutegravir, there are some unique mutations, uh, particularly mutations at codons 118 and 263 uh, that have a, a moderate effect on susceptibility. And these become important uh, as we uh, move forward. N next slide, please. So one of the unique features of, for both the dolutegravir and bictegravir, although I'll focus going forward just on dolutegravir because that is the uh, drug most widely available, uh, is that in the phase three clinical trials of uh, participants who were treatment naive at uh, initiation of antiretroviral therapy, uh, we really saw no uh, re resistance to uh, this drug. And that was in contrast to what's been observed with the first generation uh, INSTEs. Uh, uh, the spring study compared dolutegravir to raltegravir. Uh, you can see that the resistance to, uh, first of all, virologic failure to 
uh, either agent was uh, quite infrequent, but there was no emergence of resistance to dolutegravir. Only a single participant in this study developed resistance to raltegravir. And uh, strikingly, also no resistance to any of the nucleoside RT in inhibitors in the backbone uh, compared to about 20% uh, among treatment failures uh, in the raltegravir group. Next slide, please. Likewise, when dolutegravir was compared to uh, an efavirenz containing regimen, uh, you can see here that, uh, again, uh, only a small fraction of the participants had protocol-defined virologic failure, and roughly 10 in each group uh, actually had uh, genotyping performed. Um, none of the participants who had successful genotyping done in the dolutegravir group had resistance to either dolutegravir or the nucleoside backbone, and that contrasted uh, with uh, the emergence of uh, resistance uh, uh, in um, about five of the um, participants in the uh, Favrin's group, either to uh, tenofovir uh, or to uh, uh, the uh, NNRTI. Uh, next slide, please. That's not to say that dolutegravir resistance can't occur in a treatment-naive uh, patient. Uh, these are data from Rafi Landowitz and the group at uh, UCLA in a patient who had uh, very high levels of viremia uh, when uh, uh, treatment was initiated during acute uh, HIV infection. Uh, you can see over a, a million copies. Uh, the patient began on a, a combination of tenofovir FTC and dolutegravir. Uh, there was an, an initial decline in viremia, but then uh, uh, that decline stalled uh, at, uh, and then at point B, where there had been some uh, rebound, uh, you see that uh, an initial uh, uh, genotype showed emergence of a mutation in integrase at codon 163. Uh, boosted darunavir was added to the regimen and uh, a viral uh, decay resumed uh, at a third time point C. Uh, you can see that there were uh, mutations at position 148, 151, and uh, again at 163 in uh, integrase. Uh, and uh, this was by deep sequencing, uh, suggesting that there had been a selection of mutations uh, uh, during the time that uh, viral suppression was incomplete. Uh, next slide, please. Now, the sailing study was a study done in uh, treatment experienced uh, participants and compared uh, dolutegravir to raltegravir. These were uh, participants who were nucleoside, non-nucleoside, and or PI experienced, but integrase inhibitor naive. Uh, dolutegravir was superior to raltegravir in this study. However, if we look at the next slide, next slide, please. Uh, thank you. In contrast to uh, the experience in treatment naive uh, patients, uh, here we do see emergence of resistance to dolutegravir in uh, approximately 1% of the participants, uh, two of whom had a combination of mutations at 148, 140, the uh, recognized pattern for raltegravir, which is curious, and two of whom had uh, this novel mutation at 263, initially uh, identified by Mark Weinberg as the uh, uh, critical or uh, mutation for dolutegravir resistance. And that contrasted to about 5% of participants in the raltegravir arm. So resistance was still less frequent with dolutegravir, but did emerge. Uh, next slide, please. Now, uh, in participants or in patients who have prior integrase inhibitor therapy, and this is specifically prior treatment with raltegravir, uh, the Viking study was done uh, to see whether dolutegravir, uh, which has activity against some uh, raltegravir resistant viruses, uh, could affect uh, viral suppression once again. Uh, this slide from uh, the phase two trial uh, examines the distribution of susceptibility as a function of, of integrase inhibitor resistance mutations. Uh, and you can see going from the right to the left that the more mutations are present, particularly when the uh, mutation at position 148 is accompanied by uh, multiple other mutations, that the uh, fold change in susceptibility to dol dolutegravir uh, increases. Uh, note that uh, in the uh, uh, level of resistance is greater uh, for the open triangles, which are people who receive dolutegravir once a day compared to the closed uh, squares who receive dolutegravir twice daily. And that becomes relevant in the next slide. Uh, 
where we look at the treatment outcome, the primary endpoint of this study was the proportion of participants achieving uh, suppression to a virus load less than 400 copies at day 11. Um, and uh, nearly all of the participants in the twice daily group achieved suppression compared to just under 80% in the once daily group. But recall that resistance was not as high in the twice a day group. So it's not entirely clear that twice daily is, uh, is uh, superior to once daily in this uh, group of experienced patients. Uh, however, that is the official label indication. Uh, next slide, please. Now, uh, in a, a much larger context uh, and in a, a study done in lower and middle income uh, countries, the Donning uh, trial compared dolutegravir versus boosted lopinavir uh, for second line uh, treatment. Now, this is again in people who were integrase inhibitor naive, but who were quite experienced in terms of uh, nucleoside RT inhibitors. Uh, and uh, dolutegravir was superior uh, to lopinavir uh, uh, by uh, several different uh, uh, measures, uh, looking at either the intention to treat or per protocol uh, analysis. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this superiority uh, uh, persisted even in participants who had uh, resistance to 3TC or FTC, uh, whether or not the 3TC or FTC was included in the uh, second line uh, regimen. Uh, as you can see uh, here, uh, just focusing on the right-hand column, the treatment differences you see are uh, range between roughly uh, 10 and uh, 20% uh, with uh, all the different subgroups, uh, so that re regardless of uh, the background resistance and use of, uh, of the thiocytidine analog, the dolutegravir remains superior to boosted lopinavir. Next slide, please. Uh, the story is a little bit uh, less clear cut uh, in the setting of the K65R. Uh, uh, overall, uh, there was still a difference favoring uh, dolutegravir, uh, even when the K65R was present. However, when K65R was present and tenofovir was used in the uh, nucleoside backbone regimen, uh, there really wasn't uh, a, a difference, but this is in a very small number of participants. I should point out as well that the way the Donning trial uh, was designed, uh, that um, uh, participants had to have uh, uh, at least one uh, active nucleoside. So if they did have the K65R and a, a 184V, they presumably added zidovudine uh, as an additional agent uh, to the regimen, uh, and that uh, makes the um, uh, results a, a little less uh, clear cut. So we really don't have robust data on the activity of dolutegravir uh, in the setting of uh, K65R uh, with or without a 184V mutation, which would be the greatest concern in patients switching from an efavirenz based regimen from TLE to a new TLD regimen. Uh, next slide, please. Well, what about uh, transmitted uh, drug resistance? I apologize for the fuzziness of the slide. The PDF didn't uh, uh, reproduce very well here, but there's been a recent uh, case report uh, of a participant with uh, an extensive, uh, a virus that had uh, extensive uh, uh, resistance mutations against all classes, including uh, this uh, impressive collection of mutations in the integrase gene. And you can see the interpretations of this resistance uh, uh, pattern uh, by both the a ANRS and the Stanford uh, algorithms. Um, the ANRS algorithm uh, saying that the virus might still be susceptible to twice daily dolutegravir, uh, whereas the Stanford uh, 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 algorithm predicting low level resistance. Um, the, this uh, is a uh, concerning case and uh, uh, potentially a harbinger for uh, the uh, increasing occurrence of transmitted integrase inhibitor resistance in general uh, and uh, dolutegravir resistance in particular. Fortunately, these uh, re cases remain uh, quite infrequent, but we certainly have to be on the alert uh, for their potential uh, increasing uh, uh, prevalence uh, going forward. Uh, next slide, please. And then just as a, a word of uh, caution, uh, there have been numerous uh, studies that have shown that um, dolutegravir resistance readily emerges when the drug is used as monotherapy, uh, even when switching suppressed patients to 
um, a, a dolutegravir monotherapy regimen. Uh, I won't take the time to go through all of these in detail, uh, but you can see that uh, across these studies, uh, um, multiple different mutations, uh, including mutations thought to be primarily raltegravir or elvitegravir resistance mutations have emerged uh, in people uh, with failure of dolutegravir. Uh, some of these were people who had uh, either acknowledged or unacknowledged prior exposure to the other uh, earlier integrase inhibitors, but there are clear examples of the mutations such as 155H and 148R being selected by dolutegravir without any prior exposure to raltegravir. Uh, next slide, please. Ne thank you. So in conclusion, uh, resistance to dolutegravir is not observed in trials of uh, triple drug antiretroviral therapy in treatment naive participants. Uh, dolutegravir resistance can, however, emerge in treatment experienced patients uh, and in uh, dual and monotherapy. Uh, dolutegravir monotherapy, should, as a, a, a is true of all antiretroviral therapy, uh, should be avoided at all costs. Uh, the barrier to dolutegravir resistance is, is high, but the drug is not foolproof. Uh, intermittent adherence and inadequate drug exposure increase the risk of INSD resistance, and at least one case of transmitted partial resistance to dolutegravir has been reported. So I'll finish here and uh, turn this back over to Carol and Sylvia and uh, uh, look forward to the rest of the program. Thanks. Thanks very much, Dan. So um, our next speaker is John Mellers. He's head of infectious disease at the University of Pittsburgh. Um, and just before he um, does his talk, I just want to let you know that we're going to change around the session slightly and directly after John's talk will be the Q&A session and then we will um, show the video. So if anyone needs to leave, um, that they won't miss the Q&A session. So um, John will be talking to us today on HIV drug resistance and um, pre-exposure prophylaxis. John? Thanks, Carol, and good morning and afternoon to you all. And uh, thanks to the previous speakers for setting up what I'm gonna say. I'm gonna focus primarily on PrEP related resistance and our surveillance efforts. Next slide, please. I'd really like to acknowledge Irvi Parikh who helped uh, put this talk together. And she's the project uh, director for the GEMS project. So here's the good news. There's an expanding landscape of PrEP agents. Uh, TDF or tenofovir based oral PrEP uh, and then FTAF uh, with uh, uh, approval in 2019 in MSM. And uh, the piverine vaginal ring uh, has had a positive uh, uh, reading from uh, the EMA. And we've heard in the last month uh, about, or last few months, about the really potent activity and prevention of HIV infection in MSM in women uh, of injectable cabotegavir long-acting formulation. So this, this is the good news. Next slide, please. Uh, here's, here's not the bad news, but the reality is that we're using the same drugs and drug classes uh, for treatment and prevention. And uh, I've been talking about this for 10 years, and there are two trains headed towards each other on a track, and we have to avert a collision. Um, there's resistance risk uh, as a consequence between depivirine and fibrins, between uh, TDF and TAF and FTC for treatment and prevention, and most recently, cabotegavir and dolutegavir. Next slide, please. And I, I really don't need to cover the consequences of ADR and PDR uh, with ART and PrEP. Um, I think uh, the previous speakers have covered this. I would just say that if ADR uh, increases, uh, then the activity of the PrEP agent may be compromised. And I'll cover that in one slide later on. So what have we learned uh, from uh, PrEP surveillance? Next slide. So we've been at it uh, for about four years with the uh, GEMS project. Uh, we have multiple partners in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. We collect uh, 
uh, DBS from seroconverters on PrEP and would determine the frequency of resistance selection in seroconverters. And that study is ongoing. Uh, there have been a few barriers. One of the biggest barriers is lack of capacity uh, for drug resistance testing um, because the capacity is largely consumed by ART driven uh, resistance testing, uh, which makes a lot of sense. It was there first and the need is, uh, is, is large. And so uh, one thing we have to address as a community is how to bolster PrEP related drug resistance surveillance. So next slide. And, and here's uh, the important finding. So if you look at the uh, middle bar, uh, those are uh, the proportion of individuals, less than 5%, who developed resistance in randomized clinical trials of TDF, uh, FTC-based PrEP. Um, in, in the bottom bar is individuals who enrolled in randomized clinical trials who were infected at the time of enrollment that was unrecognized because they were in the window phase of infection. And it's 42%. And that's one important lesson we've learned. We need to screen out acute infection when starting PrEP. But in the quote unquote real world setting of rollout of TDF FTC based PrEP, we found 23% resistance uh, to the agents, either 65R and or 184I or B. So this is uh, a little bit concerning and needs to be uh, followed. Next slide. We also found high rates of uh, PDR and seroconverters on PrEP. Uh, only about half were wild type, lots of uh, transmission of NNRTI resistance and uh, uh, only a minority have N NRTI only. So resistant virus transmission is occurring and it's consistent uh, with the WHO national survey data uh, that has uh, shown uh, variable but uh, increasing prevalence of PDR. Uh, next slide, please. So a PrEP is highly effective, but it is not uh, uh, totally effective, particularly when the person transmitting or exposing the PrEP recipient has resistant virus. And uh, fortunately, uh, breakthrough cases related to resistance are still at the case report level, uh, seven at the time uh, we put this, uh, this um, slide together. I think the literature gets saturated and editors don't like to publish single case reports after a while. So there's the risk that we are underestimating transmitted resistance causing a PrEP failure. So again, we need to keep an eye on this um, and uh, do the surveillance uh, to monitor the frequency of transmitted drug resistance that breaks through the PrEP agents. And next slide. So uh, the, the most important take home message from my talk is continued surveillance for uh, PrEP, uh, seroconverters and resistance in those individuals is essential. Next slide, please. So what are the unanswered questions that we have moving forward related to that expanded PrEP landscape? Next slide, please. So uh, Dan touched on this and others touched on this. Uh, what is the impact of PrEP resistance on future ART response? It's still unknown. Uh, shown here is a modeling exercise from Andrew Phillips. Uh, and the take home message is that if one starts a diotegavir based regimen, uh, the, the effect is uh, that viral load suppression is uh, the greatest as opposed to a second line PI-based regimen or a NNRTI-based first line regimen. And we know this from a, a, a distillation of existing data over the years. And Andrew put this in the model with various assumptions, but 
this is a model and not, not actual data. Next slide. So in terms of the depivirine ring, uh, we did extensive studies in the phase three uh, trials. And what we found is that in, in individuals who were using the ring or not using the ring in the randomized clinical trial, that the frequency of NNRTI resistance in the ASPIRE study, the ring study, and the HOPE rollout study was really not different between the two arms. And so uh, this really suggests that the ring is not selecting resistance in the individuals to converting. But next slide, please. Uh, but we do not know the efficacy of the depivirin ring in the setting where the donor of virus has extensive NNRTI resistance. Similarly, we, we don't know uh, whether uh, there's going to be a reduction in efficacy of cabotegravir long A, long acting in individuals who have uh, NNR, excuse me, uh, integrase inhibitor resistance in their regimen. But as Dan pointed out, it, the, the, the frequency of transmitted INI or integrase inhibitor resistance is extremely low. So uh, the concern that we're going to start seeing uh, integrase LA or cabotegravir LA uh, breakthrough because of donor resistance is low. But the bigger concern is this PK profile shown here of cabotegravir LA. Uh, it's not a, a steady line. There, there are peaks and troughs. And depending on when it is administered and when uh, the individual returns for uh, redosing, uh, the, the levels can get um, minimally therapeutic or uh, subtherapeutic. And the concern here uh, is that we'll see breakthrough infection and selection of resistance because of lingering cabotegravir levels. And that would create a source of integrase inhibitor resistance that could be transmitted. So I'm more concerned and we should be more concerned about this scenario. The next thing we really need to scrutinize is uh, the frequency of resistance with our most sensitive methods in the HPTN 083 and 084 studies. The initial reports, this is relatively infrequent, but it's not absent. And so uh, moving forward, I think this is our highest priority, uh, looking at how often PrEP breakthrough of CAB-LA is associated with resistance, because there's a lot at stake here uh, if we start seeing more transmitted uh, cabotegravir resistance and the likely cross resistance with dalutegravir, um, we uh, could undermine uh, the TLD-based rollout. Next slide. So uh, in conclusion, PrEP surveillance provides key information on rates of transmitted resistance in seroconverter. It defines the rate of resistance in individuals who seroconvert during or after tenofovir-based uh, PrEP, the pivoting ring, or CAB-LA use. And the timeline for CAB-LA rollout is, is, is uh, much further ahead than the pivoting. So the, the next uh, big change will be the pressure or the selective pressure induced by rollout of the, the pivoting ring. Um, and that uh, PDR and ADR surveillance is needed to mitigate the impact of overlapping resistance profiles. I'm glad uh, Dan concluded that diotegravir was not foolproof. It is not. Uh, and if we're sloppy with it, which we, we should not be, uh, we can start seeing a, a loss of efficacy of TLD, which would be really a unfortunate 
So surveillance and conclusion is critical for preserving ARVs for both treatment and prevention. Next slide. And I'd just uh, like to conclude by recognizing our, uh, our great team and our fabulous partners in multiple countries uh, in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, and, and, and acknowledge funding from USAID uh, and PEPFAR for the GEMS project. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, John. So um, before we start the movie, we'll just do a few um, questions that have come up um, while everyone's been speaking um, and then show the movie afterwards. So if anyone has to leave, they, they don't miss the Q&A. So I think one of the, the questions, and, and Dan, you did, uh, I suppose this is directed at you, but uh, John might uh, want to add from a prep perspective as well. But you spoke around, you know, the dawning trial, the case 65 bar mutation M184V. Um, so I suppose my question, to you and, and not to be too uh, provocative, but would you treat a pay, would you put someone on um, dolutegravir with XTC and tenofovir if they had the K65R and M184V mutation? Uh, no, not if I could avoid it. I mean, I, I think the concern is that you could be giving what amounts to uh, effective dolutegravir monotherapy. Now there is one caveat, and this is why we so badly need the data. We know that the 184B mutation sensitizes virus to tenofovir, and uh, you know, in vitro, even with a 65R, uh, if you have a virus with a dual mutation, they may still have a susceptibility to tenofovir. Uh, but how that plays out in in patients is what we really need to understand. And because there were so few people who fit that category. In uh, dawning, we just don't have an adequate database. And the study that the uh, AIDS clinical trials is doing uh, observationally in people uh, uh, transitioning to a dilutegravir based regimen is going to generate those data. Thanks. Thanks very much. And I think um, also, you know, like with what uh, John has just presented with the types of mutations we're seeing with PrEP, that that probably also does need to be um, considered. Can I just add that? that uh, from the second line study um, and, and, and other studies that, that the news was fairly good that switching to a second line PI based regimen, despite an, an NRTI resistance, uh, the responses were good, um, better than I would have predicted and maybe Dan would have predicted. I think the key uh, issue is whether the combination of 65R and 184V um, puts the individual at much higher risk of selecting resistance to the PI or the integrase inhibitor. And so, uh, as Dan says, we have a tiny bit of information on 65R and we need to, we need to carefully look at that. Um, but if there's just 184V and you put, a, put an individual on Tenofovir, 3TC, and dilutegravir, or uh, tenofovir, 3TC, and a boosted GI, I suspect the responses would be very good. Oh, yes. For, for, for 184V alone, absolutely. Yeah. We have a question on raltegravir, which is now recommended in infant less than four weeks of age. What is the risk of cross-resistance to dolutegravir after virological failure on a raltegravir-based regimen? Thank you. I think that's a very uh, challenging uh, issue. Uh, clearly, raltegravir is so much better tolerated than what has been the standard uh, in infants who uh, presumably had some nevirapine exposure or fabrin's exposure, which is uh, to use a boosted uh, 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 protease inhibitor, uh, the longer term tolerability of the boosted oral uh, liquid boosted PI regimen has been poor. Uh, so hopefully uh, there would be better uh, adherence and suppression, but there is certainly the concern that um, if you generated uh, raltegravir resistance, particularly with unmonitored prolonged treatment failure, you could uh, longer term compromise the efficacy of the TLD regimen. Yeah, I, I think this is a critical issue. Um, a, you know, given that, that uh, resistance is frequent in infants, um, and then recycling the nucleosides and giving raltegravir 
uh, may really compromise the long-term treatment options for that child. And we have to think in terms of decades of treatment options. Uh, there are agents uh, in development that could rescue the situation, but as we know, they reach children last. Um, and so it's a real concern and an unknown. I, I, I know that the a boosted PI regimen is very poorly uh, tolerated, but I'd be very cautious about giving raltegavir uh, in, in the context of a pre-existing resistance to uh, NNRTI, excuse me, NRTIs. So we've reached the end of this webinar today. I would like to thank you all for being with us, to thank the speakers for their great talks, to thank Dan, John, Seth, and Michael. I would like to thank my co-chair, Carol. Thank you, Carol. Uh, we have learned a lot today during this webinar. You have learned that WHO has developed new methodologies to assess HIV drug resistance among people failing antiretroviral therapy, including dolutegravir. So more data on dolutegravir resistance will be available soon as countries are scaling up this new approach. We have learned that integrase inhibitors uh, are a new class of uh, antiretrovirals used both for treatment as well as for prevention. Integrase inhibitors can be affected by intermittent adherence, so we really have to pay attention to uh, preventing resistance to this new class of drugs. Um, Dolucegravir uh, uh, has, has a high genetic barrier to resistance. However, this drug is not foolproof. And again, it's a call for paying attention to prevent resistance um, and uh, to preserve the long-term effectiveness of this, of this drug. We have learned that uh, resistance among individuals um, infected with HIV, despite taking PrEP, it's possible and actually is, is high uh, as uh, in people uh, taking PrEP uh, in, during, in, 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 in countries in the rollout of ART or, or PrEP programs. And the resistance in this population is higher than what we have been seeing in PrEP clinical trials. Um, and it's a call for, therefore, to uh, increase uh, the uptake of surveillance uh, and look at resistance in population infected with HIV despite PrEP. And, that, uh, and the good news is that WHO has developed uh, new methods to assess HIV drug resistance in population infected with HIV despite, PrEP, despite taking PrEP. These new methods have been launched today, has been, uh, have been presented today, um, and hopefully countries will, uh, will use these methods to assess resistance in PrEP um, scale up. Um, we have also with that, um, I would like to conclude uh, this uh, webinar, but before I would like to invite you all to uh, stay with us for an additional 15 minutes if you have time. WHO has developed a video uh, and interviewed a few people uh, to hear their view and their opinion about ways to tackle HIV drug resistance and to prevent it. Um, so to celebrate the World Antimicrobial Awareness Week, we would like to invite you to stay with us and watch this video together. Thank you. Hi, my name is Silvia Bertagnolio. I am the technical lead on HIV drug resistance at the World Health Organization in Geneva. You will be watching testimonies from civil society, from Minister of Health, from implementing partners, from academia, from donors, on why HIV drug resistance is important why we should pay attention to resistance and what we can do to prevent its emergence and spread. Stay with us. Hello, my name is Professor Ravi Gupta. Uh, I'm at the University of Cambridge and I'm Professor of Clinical Microbiology here. My name is Eleanor Namsoke Magongo. I'm a paediatrician. I work with the Ministry of Health. My name is Bovi Tram. I'm a molecular biologist, epidemiologist, working with Epicentre Médecins Sans Frontières based in Paris. So I'm Gilles Van Kutzen from Médecins Sans Frontières, Doctors Without Borders. Hello, my name is Siobhan Crowley and I'm the head of HIV at the Global Fund for TB, AIDS and Malaria. Uh, hi, I am uh, Dr. Anu Gurung. Uh, I'm the team leader Communicable Diseases, WHO Country Office, Papua New Guinea. I'm called Moses Supercharger. I live in Uganda, the capital city, Kampala, and I'm a person who has been living with HIV since 1994. My name is Namwanje Shakira. I am a young person living with HIV. 
HIV drug resistance means the virus became capable to evade the treatment by mutating, uh, meaning viral replication is no longer blocked. And HIV is actually particularly good at this. It has a very high replication rate. And while replicating, it constantly introduces random mutations into its genome, uh, which are basically an error, but also render the virus much more flexible. So for example, in a situation of incomplete treatment adherence, where you have suboptimal drug levels, this situation selects mutations that happen to render the virus resistance to the treatment. At the level of the individual, drug resistance means treatment failure and the risk to develop advanced disease and death. At population level, HIV drug resistance is a major threat to epidemic control, specifically the third global target of having at least 95% of people on treatment virologically suppressed is compromised by HIV drug resistance. Drug resistance increases HIV transmission, morbidity and mortality and burdens the health system. So it's very important to ensure continuous surveillance of drug resistance, to implement quality of care to prevent resistance, and also to create awareness at the level of policymakers, but also for providers and people living with HIV. The most critical aspects of HIV drug resistance that uh, people should be aware of is uh, first of all that over the past 20 years uh, HIV drug resistance has been increasing uh, especially in southern and eastern Africa where uh, um, up to and more than 10 percent of uh, people with HIV starting antiretroviral therapy were resistant to the first line antiretroviral treatment um, uh, for HIV. HIV drug resistance leads to treatment failure. Treatment failure leads to new illnesses, death, and uh, transmission of drug resistant virus. If a patient has HIV drug resistance, they're going to have a high viral load that will affect their level of uh, uh, immunity and their ability to fight infections. It will make them sickly. It will reduce their productivity. And in turn, if this person is the breadwinner in their home, this is going to cascade to their family. My name is Namwanje Shakira. I am a young person living with HIV. I am an HIV prevention advocate. I am a women's health activist. HIV drug resistance affects the lives of people living in low-income countries in a sense that uh, the higher, the more you keep failing on your medication, you get a more pill burden as the medication keeps on increasing, the tablets keep on increasing as per each line that you fail. And also uh, with drug resistance, we are getting more cases of more young, young children being born with HIV because their parents were not adhering of their parents got drug resistance and in the in, in the end they gave to they gave birth to kids that were already hiv positive and then the other thing is it actually leads to loss of life once people fail their medication and reach the third line which is the last level of treatment and they cannot be they, they cannot be helped by the third line treatment that leads to death or you know end of one's life I'm called Moses Supercharger. I live in Uganda, the capital city Kampala, and I'm a person who has been living with HIV since 1994. Basically what I do in Uganda is to promote quality HIV treatment for people living with HIV, and also to educate and empower people living with HIV about the dangers of HIV drug resistance in Africa. People living with HIV all over the world have the biggest role to play to prevent the emergence of HIV drug resistance. One, they need to take their medication religiously to prevent resistance because majority of people failing happen because of poor adherence. So number one, we need to take our medications correctly all the time as prescribed by a health worker. That's our role number one. Secondly, as stakeholders and people living with HIV, we need to find a way of promoting treatment literacy all over the world. Majority of people who fail, fail because they don't know. 
the cause of resistance. People need to be empowered about the cause of HIV drug resistance. People need to be empowered about the solutions to HIV drug resistance. People need to be empowered about the dangers of HIV drug resistance. That is still lacking. So as advocates, uh, stakeholders, people living with HIV, we need to carry out a global campaign educating the masses about the danger of this problem of HIV drug resistance. Uh, what we can do to prevent uh, HIV drug resistance among young people is first of all we need to educate and engage their caretakers. If young people take their medication, they have their caretakers that help with their treatment. This is a group of people that I feel we have neglected and we need to include them in the treatment literacy plan. We need to teach them about the, the importance of drug adherence and the dangers of drug resistance. Yes, and then for the young people, we need to empower them with information. They need to know why are they taking their medication. They need to know the dangers of not adhering to their medication and as well, what are the benefits of sticking to your treatment plan religiously and hopefully we'll have a better and changed world. We have to prevent HIV uh, drug resistant virus to emerge in the first place. To prevent HIV drug resistance, one needs to take a treatment every day as prescribed and for that there is a need for a continuous uh, supply of medication, there is a need for very good adherence uh, from the patient and there is a need for uh, very good support. In the clinic so you need a good supply chain, you need uh, supportive health staff and you need to ensure that health services make it as easy as possible for patients to take their treatment every day. And uh, that includes uh, giving longer supplies, three months, six months. It includes uh, what we call differentiated service delivery, uh, adapting services to the needs of the patient, providing antiretroviral therapy in the community if that's necessary, um, providing enhanced adherence support to those who need it. Uh, it also requires uh, early detection with viral load of people who are failing treatment and at risk of developing drug resistance. Uh, requires healthcare staff to act upon um, uh, high viral loads, which is a sign of uh, um, a treatment failure, and then uh, requires uh, healthcare workers to switch patients to the adequate uh, second or third line uh, regimen. Of course, that also means that these second and third line regimens must be present. We need national oversight of whether drug resistance is occurring, where it's occurring, when, how, who, and then to formulate a response to that. When drug resistance emerges, this must be identified uh, rapidly. It requires surveillance by countries so that we know how much drug resistance there is in the population and so that uh, treatment regimens can be uh, timely adapted uh, as has been the case now with the change of first-line treatment from um, uh, efavirenz to dolutegravir. In Papua New Guinea we um, had the initial drug resistance survey done in about 2004 which showed about 2%, and then uh, another surveillance was done in 2015, which showed a resistance of 16% in the subpopulation level. But at the national level, we did a national pretreatment drug resistance survey, which showed extremely high levels of drug resistance, both in the ART naive and non naive patients. This was almost the third highest in globally, and therefore, there was a need to change those drugs. And this happened only in 2019. And with the advent of 2020, we could purchase these drugs uh, with, with the adequate uh, analysis and advocacy to the government. So the government could uh, allocate that the money for the, buying the drugs.
But to roll out these drugs uh, the, during the COVID-19 response was a big challenge. Uh, and we used uh, innovative methods like using Google Classrooms for ARV prescribers, looking at community surveillance and people living with HIV networks to look at whether the drugs are being received or not. And the amazing thing was that we could do a transition of these drugs to almost 92% during a COVID epidemic. We, in countries with weak health systems, which do not have adequate facilities for drug resistance um, uh, to be done at individual levels, we need these kind of surveys to be done, even if the rollout of DTG. Because of huge levels of national stockouts, weak health systems, drug distribution issues, lack of adherence, and huge loss to follow up in countries like in Africa and in Asia and the Pacific. Therefore, I feel that the drug resistance surveys need to be done periodically uh, to look at a population level on drug resistance uh, and, and the emerging threat of, uh, of uh, running out of drugs for HIV treatment. Monitoring uh, HIV drug resistance is very key because it is going to reduce the cost of the HIV program. How? Because if you keep most of the patients on their first line ART treatment, you are going to prevent uh, the country from procuring, procuring a lot of a costly a second and third line uh, ARVs. So if patients are supported uh, to have their treatment optimized, they will stay on their first line or second line for a long time and it will prevent us from moving on to the higher levels of treatment which are more costly with a high pill burden. So the cost of the program will be reduced. Secondly, at a social economic level, the productivity of the country is going to improve because you're going to have more healthy people who are able to work, look after their uh, families and pay their taxes and therefore the social economic status of the country is also going to do better when you have a healthy uh, population. I think there are a number of key questions that we need to answer in resource limited settings about drug resistance. And the first one pertains to the use of dolutegravir, a second generation integrase inhibitor that has now been scaled up uh, hugely in sub-Saharan Africa and across Asia. And this second generation integrase inhibitor is replacing the old drug efavirenz in most regimens. And the speed at which this has happened has been remarkable but I think we need to know what the outcomes are of this rapid transition. And we need to understand whether drug resistance before the switch um, has compromised potentially uh, the su success of treatment on, on, on dolutegravir. Secondly, we need to know how uh, drug resistance transmission is progressing over time in response to this uh, policy change about first-line treatment and therefore surveillance of integrase resistance in patients presenting for HIV care is critical. HIV drug resistance has to be an integral part of the HIV response. There's no way we can be managing large treatment cohorts without knowing what resistance patterns are there when people are first diagnosed with HIV infection, what happens to people on treatment, and also really importantly, how we respond to make sure that we minimize drug resistance. It's very important for countries to have a national action plans on HIV drug resistance because it supports us to understand the gaps that they have in this particular area, which leads uh, the country to plan and develop targeted interventions to address uh, the gaps around HIV uh, drug uh, resistance. Uh, secondly, uh, this enables countries to come up with a policy framework that is able to support the implementation of HIV drug resistance in the country. And thirdly, in the action plan, we usually include a section that enables us to monitor what we are doing are around HIV drug resistance. And this monitoring is very important, especially when it comes to uh, early warning indicators that highlight uh, the burden of HIV drug resistance uh, uh, in the country. So you need an action plan to support you to be able to monitor what you are doing. And uh, uh, lastly, 
uh, it's very important uh, because uh, donors will support what you have within your action plans, your strategic uh, action plans, and uh, what you have in your policy framework. So by all means, having a national uh, HIV drug resistance action plan is going to be very instrumental for resource mobilization to guide implementation and monitoring of HIV drug resistance in the country. What the Global Fund does to help fight against HIV drug resistance is we support countries. When it makes most sense, we would encourage countries to put it into a funding request. When the government already has a robust laboratory and surveillance mechanism, it's much more sustainable and in the long-term interests of the country to make sure that the drug resistance is an integral part of that. Hi there, I hope you enjoyed the video. The take home message is, if we don't look for resistance, we will not find it. If we find it, but we don't act upon the finding by uh, fixing the root causes that generated resistance and by preventing its spread, we will be accounted responsible. We can only end AIDS if we also end HIV drug resistance.